The China in Africa podcast is brought to you in partnership with the Africa China Reporting Project at Wits University in Johannesburg. The ACRP aims to improve the quality of reporting on Africa China relations through reporting grants, workshops, and other opportunities for journalists. More information at africachinareporting.co.za and our dedicated training website at africachinatraining.com. Hello and welcome to another edition of the China in Africa podcast, a proud member of the Syndicate Network from SubChina. I'm Eric Olander, and as always, I'm joined by Kobus van Staden, the senior China-Africa researcher at the South African Institute of International Affairs in Johannesburg, South Africa. A very good afternoon to you, Kobus. Good afternoon. Kobus, today we're going to be talking about Chinese state-owned enterprises, and when we talk about Chinese companies that are active in Africa— I think a lot of people, well, they just think they're normal companies. They don't really quite understand the dynamic of what Chinese state-owned enterprises are and the differences necessarily between a traditional Chinese SOE and, say, a private company. You know, these are brands for a lot of people in Africa and around the world that don't really resonate. Oftentimes, the names sound really exotic. And other than a few like Huawei or Transin, most of these companies don't do a whole lot in the way of branding or corporate outreach. In fact, a lot of times the reasons why people actually even know the names of Chinese companies is because they're in the news for the wrong reasons. As we're seeing, let's say just this week, here are the kind of things that we're hearing about from some Chinese companies. And again, I'm just drawing from the headlines of the past few days. Uh, China Mali, which is the world's second largest cobalt and copper producer, is now having its contracts reviewed by the DR Congo. That's a very controversial process underway in Kinshasa. Uh, there's a company called Zhejiang Tianjian Construction Company that is under investigation in Kenya now for a crane accident that fell last week and killed nine workers. And workers on a Sino Hydro project in Ghana walked off the job last week to protest against low pay, lack of drinking water on the job, and managers who don't speak English. Now, if that sounds familiar, that is a lot of what the discourse around Chinese companies in Africa is. But while so much of the focus is on those controversial aspects of Chinese companies operating in Africa, that oftentimes obscures a more nuanced understanding of these companies and how they operate, and more importantly, whether certain aspects of these companies and their governance models are applicable uh, for certain African countries. Now, when we talk about Chinese state-owned enterprises, I suspect that a lot of our listeners in the U.S. will think there is absolutely nothing redeeming about them at all. These are entities that are very much at the center of disputes between the U.S. and China over concerns that they get preferential treatment by the government in the forms of protection from foreign competitors, subsidies, and they have access to a bottomless pit of credit. We in the U.S. just don't have these same kind of state-owned enterprises. So a lot of the discussion just rubs Americans the wrong way. But in Europe, here in Asia, and certainly in Africa, Cobus, people are a lot more comfortable with the role that state-run companies play in the economy, especially in a place like South Africa, where they've looked to replicate parts of the Chinese model. So there may be some lessons to draw from the SOE governance model. Yeah, there's there's two big issues to discuss in relation to SOEs, Chinese SOEs in Africa. One is the fact that Chinese SOEs do not do a ton of business in Africa, and so therefore it's really important to understand what they are, who who like what they do, how they're different from private companies, which kind of pressures they face, and so on. At the same time, a lot of African countries have large state-owned enterprises or semi-state-owned enterprises, many of whom, like for example in South Africa, are complete nightmare basket cases. Um, And so there's a lot that African countries want to learn about SOE reform from China and the the wider reality that a lot of of African governments are very interested in China's model where the government maintains a kind of a central control and then government affiliated companies, you know, kind of drive economic growth. That has not really succeeded in many African countries, but China, you know, presents this kind of example of how it possibly could. Um, And with that, then, you know, also for reform-minded Africans, they're very interested in how China managed to to combat uh, corruption, 
within those uh, state-owned org- organizations because in Africa they are frequently kind of hotbeds of corruption and state capture. So I think it's important for us to start our discussion with some definitions here because I think when a lot of people think about Chinese state-owned enterprises, they think that these are companies that are controlled or owned by Beijing, the central government, when in fact that's actually just one of four or five different types or tiers of actors here. So we do have a lot of central government companies. So these are the big national champions, if you will. Then provinces, and this is where we hear from Zhejiang and Fujian and Guangdong, those come up quite a bit. Then there are municipalities. So the companies like Shanghai Electric uh, that have literally revenues that are as large as the Zimbabwean economy. And then it even goes down to districts and county levels as well. And that may sound a little bit weird, but the fact is, is that there are districts and counties in China that are as large in many respects as as states, provinces, or even countries in other, in small countries in other parts of the world. So that's an important distinction that we want to make in terms of we don't only want to think of SOEs in the context of the central government or the Chinese SOE. I put that air quotes, which you can't see right there. So... With all of that in mind, this was really interesting this month when there was a new policy insight report that was published by Kobus, your your house at the South African Institute of International Affairs, Lessons for Africa in Chinese SOE Governance, written by Luke Jordan. Luke is a practitioner in residence at the MIT Governance Lab. He's supposed to be in Massachusetts right now, in Boston, but we've caught him in Berlin because he can't get into the U.S. So uh, we're, we're glad that you have some time. Welcome to the program, Luke, and we're really excited to talk with you. It's a pleasure. I'm very glad to be on. So in this COVID era, as Kobus alluded to, uh, state companies like airlines and power companies in Africa are struggling mightily. I mean, we've seen bailout after bailout now of Kenya Airlines in South Africa. It's almost daily news that the state companies are, are being bailed out. Do you think with all of that in mind that there are in fact lessons from China's model of state capitalism that actually could be applied to African companies and certain African countries that have their own SOEs? Or is China's model politically and economically just so unique that it really doesn't apply? Well, I think we have to steer between two extremes. I think there's an extreme which says, well, China did it, therefore let's just plug and play. And we've actually seen, I mean, in South Africa, I think there's an opposition politician who did a thesis on China's SASAC, which is the state-owned State Asset Administration Commission, which runs a lot of the SOEs and said, let's just import that. We'll just create a copy of of that institution and that'll work. And I don't think that's appropriate because that's going to run into too many problems of context and too many problems of just the enormous differences between China and African countries. But I think it's also wrong to say that we can't learn anything. So there are certain principles that we can understand in how China has managed its SOEs, how it continues to manage its SOEs. And I think when you understand those principles or the kind of systemic characteristics, then you can start to do the work of altering that and contextualizing it and then understanding, well, maybe we can't replicate the whole model, but there's a small piece of it that if we adapt it in certain ways, might be a useful starting point for a reform conversation here. So I think it's a, it's a process of um, understanding the basic principles and the characteristics of the system and then using that for inspiration for a local process of initiating some ideas for reform and then carrying those out. As Eric mentioned, you know, there, there's very different perspectives on SOEs from different parts of the world. Um, so I was wondering what you feel are some of the bigger uh, misconceptions about Chinese SOEs that you found among Africans and then among Westerners. Um, you know, um, because as, as Eric pointed out, there's a, there's a lot of of kind of, well, you know, kind of half understood kind of assumptions um, about what a Chinese SOE is, you know, particularly in the US. Um, so, you know, kind of so, so, so how did you found Africans and non-Africans kind of getting, well, what did they get wrong, respectively, about Chinese SOEs? Well, I think the, 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 the dominant one is um, what Eric alluded to, which is the idea that because something is an SOE, it takes commands directly from Beijing and that that's a fairly simple process where sort of the Chinese uh, state at the center makes decisions and the SOEs march. Um, and I think that's just really not the case in a lo- in most instances for two reasons. One is, as Eric mentioned, only some of the SOEs are owned by the center. A lot of them are provincial. 
And, you know, and this is a theme of Chinese governance that it's often quite complicated, the relationships between province and center. Um, and then second, there are a number of levels between, for example, a ministry and a given SOE. So the uh, Ministry of Energy, for example, um, can't exactly tell a energy related SOE, here is an instruction because that SOE is governed by by this um, institution called SASAC, which then reports to cabinet. And so there has to be a whole conversation about how that happens. And then even then the managers in that in, in that government in that um, company or that SOE will interpret some of those instructions. So I think it's sort of saying, well, um, uh, the same way that a Western company, it's very dangerous to to think that because, say, a given Western company is a subsidiary of a U.S. company that has a majority owner who has a certain agenda, that therefore the subsidiary in Africa, even with these multiple intermediate steps of governance, is just going to do what the majority owner um, in the U.S. wants. And sometimes that majority owner, if they're a passive portfolio um, investor, might not even know what's happening with the subsidiary. So I think it's that. It's that. It's the idea. The principal misconception is the idea that sort of um, all SOEs are. Um, are almost companies without agency, whereas SOEs all do have some degree of agency and they're part of a very complex and very large scale system. Let's get right to it then, to the bottom line here. So what are one or two things that you think African governments can draw from the Chinese governance model on SOEs and give us one or two things that you think they should absolutely stay away from? Just get right to the conclusions here. Right. So I think the first thing and the really principal thing is to understand that this is not a you do it once and you're finished. So China has been reforming its SOEs for the last 30 to 40 years. Um, there have been cycles which build on each other. Whereas I think what often happens when you look at policy debates in Africa, which is often inflicted by sort of the multilateral institutions and others, there's an idea that we do it once and then it's finished. Um Whereas in China, there have been multiple waves and those waves build on each other. So look at what's possible now and then do what's next and then do what's next. So I think that principle of this is a continually moving target um, and there's continual improvement is one. I think the second is pay a lot of attention to how you can most effectively discipline and monitor SOE managers. So the principal tool China uses there is competition. Um, and that's where, I mean, the most fascinating thing I think that people, uh, takes people by surprise about Chinese SOEs is they're often in competition with each other because China creates multiple competing units within the same industry and then will observe how they um, compete with each other to be able to judge how well their managers are doing. Is that both domestically and internationally? Generally, yes. Sometimes if it's, an inter if it's a global industry where scale is really important, they might then um, combine SOEs or have just one. But sometimes, again, going back to this being continual, you know, the China Railway, uh, the CRRC, which produces high-speed trains and subways, um, they were one company. Then in the kind of late 2000s into early 2010s, they were actually divided into a northern and a southern branch, which were two wholly different companies. They were left to compete with each other for about um, a period of, of almost a decade. Um, and then they were recombined. And it was clear that the northern unit had done better. And so it kind of came out on top and its managers um, ended up as the, the running the whole combined unit. Um, and then that went out to, to compete globally. So it can often kind of flip between them. But for example, in, in, in minerals, um, again, there's been some consolidation, but it's also the case that there's multiple Chinese SOEs in copper and they do sometimes compete with each other. Um, and sometimes that's a trend in Chinese, um, often the, the, the Chinese commentators will sometimes say there's too much competition. They're bidding up asset prices and then there'll be an attempt at coordination. But the competition is fairly widespread domestically and internationally. This issue of, of, how, of how they, they kind of create competitions structurally um, in the market is really interesting for me, um, you know, especially also because in, in Africa frequently the, the SOEs that, that exist frequently just end up inheriting monopolies. Um, and, you know, and then, and then when, they, when they actually face private sector competition, then they frequently find themselves really kind of incapable to compete. Um, the South African Broadcasting Corporation in, in, in South Africa, I think, is a good example of that. It's kind of slow, slow into mediocrity and then kind of get getting cut off at the knees where once you know satellite tv came in um so i was wondering how, how you see that kind of structural creation of competition is do, do you foresee that that could be a, a viable kind of principle for african soes as well yes with qualifications so i think 
Um, actually, just a, a great example in broadcasting is so China, the provinces will each have SOEs, which kind of compete with each other. And some of them have become very innovative, like Hunan TV in the mid 2000s was one of the pioneers in reality TV shows um, and like idols type competitions in China and became enormously successful and has since done other really compelling programming. Um, the, the, the qualifications are. You know, China does have provinces that are the size of a country. So if you create a SOE in multiple provinces, that still has a certain scale. Um, I think we shouldn't, we should be cognizant of that, but not overplay it. Because again, in South Africa, you know, the ESCOM fleet is big enough that you could divide it into four or five generating companies. SA, the SABC is large enough that you could probably create, you know, split off different TV stations, etc. So you can still do it. You just have to think a little bit more. Whereas in China, it's fairly straightforward to just say this province, this province. Uh, the second thing is you do have to be careful about perverse consequences in the details of how they report. So um, one of the things in China is because um, a lot of the reporting happens to bodies that report to like the whole of cabinet. It's quite hard to capture whoever appoints the people who run those SOEs. So if you, for example, um, split uh, uh, the electricity SOE into three generating companies, but it was still the same minister who appointed the head of those three SOEs, you might actually have done something counterproductive because then by just capturing that minister, I can still capture all three of those SOEs. Um, and it might actually become easier to form a coalition to do that because I can you know, very easily say, okay, you get SOE one, I get two, you get three. So you have to be careful about what those reporting structures look like um, to avoid being able to just capture all of the, the divided SOEs at once. Um, but it can still, it's, it's quite a powerful principle and it has generally worked quite well in allowing them to compare across the different units. It's interesting that you said that some Chinese provinces are the size of countries. It, it actually is even larger than that. Let me just give you some context here. Africa's GDP last year was $2.6 trillion. Guangdong's GDP, just the southern Chinese province last year, was $1.6 trillion. So almost two-thirds of, uh, of what all of Africa was. And then Zhejiang, home to Alibaba, and uh, an Iwu big trading port with Africa was nine hundred and thirty six billion dollars last year. So almost a trillion dollars about, you know, incredible that it's almost half the size of all of Africa. So huge, huge economies there just at the provincial level. And I think that goes missing for a lot of people who don't really understand it too well on that. But when we talk about Again, the, the Chinese SOE model, so much of it is predicated on Chinese support. The subsidies are critical to their survival in many respects. This has been one of the contentious issues, for example, in some of the mineral exporting areas. So people are saying that you know countries like South Africa have to do a better job at processing their minerals so that they can compete, add value to them. The problem is, though, is that when those minerals are exported to China— they're then put into a whole system, a supply chain that has subsidized electricity, subsidized water, subsidized tax preferences, all these different advantages that make it impossible for a country like South Africa to compete or any other African country to compete. Talk to us about the role of subsidies in Chinese state-owned enterprises and whether or not that makes it almost impossible for African countries who don't have the same resources to subsidize their SOEs to really effectively model themselves after what China's doing. So that is absolutely a core element of how SOEs run and how they're able to do what they do. Um, so, for example, the principal channel really is the bank loans, is the ability to access credit more or less on tap and often at um, fairly low rates. It's well known in China that sort of bank managers, even when they're not commanded to, you know, a loan to an SOE, you know you're going to get paid back, at least until recently. That started to actually change a little bit in the last year or two. Um, but really for the last 20, 30 years for, or longer, um, if you made a loan to an SOE, you knew you were getting it back. So you like to do that and you gave them um, generous terms. Um, then, as you say, there were some tax uh, implications and generally less pressure to make immediate short term sort of uh, market returns. On the one hand, um, the two qualifications is on the one hand, it's not always clear that that has led to um, high efficiencies amongst SOEs. In fact, a common theme of criticism within China and of um, both by Chinese economists and 
um, outside economists is that actually this has made, these subsidies have made the SOEs have undercut some of the work of governance and have made a number of the SOEs more inefficient than they otherwise would be. Um, and certainly if you look, sometimes the leading edge SOEs, the ones that are doing best, are ones that come from small provinces um, and have had maybe less of that kind of treatment. Um, the second thing I would also though mention is the um, I'm not sure it's entirely the case that um, African states don't provide their SOEs with those kinds of levels of subsidies. No, they do, but they just, they do, but they don't have the resources to do it. Is, well, I guess they, they don't have the, the capacity in terms of the wealth that China has to put towards its SOEs. But I think if you, if, you, if you boil that down to the specific instance of a specific facility, you know, in South Africa, for example, the aluminium smelters downstream, they get heavily subsidized electricity. Sure, it's not aluminium cells of the size of China, but for that specific smelter or for a specific processing facility, the amount of subsidies that you get, um, that, you, that you can put behind that specific instance are there. Where China can do it differently is, of course, they can do it across, you know, every industry and across multiple different scales. Um, but I think if there's a focused effort, and remember, a lot of these SOEs rose 20, 30 years ago um, when China was still or was already large, but a number of those provinces were quite poor and didn't have the resources they have today. So yes, it's absolutely an advantage. Yes, it is difficult for Africa to compete on that. I think that's sometimes used as a, um, I mean, certainly in South Africa, I think, and, and, and in certain other countries that's used as an excuse for not doing a coherent, um, active industrial policy, which is what's necessary. It's sort of, oh, well, we're never going to be able to compete with the Chinese SOEs, so we're not going to bother, or we tried it and it didn't work and we didn't really innovate, or we didn't try and iterate or improve the policy instruments. Um, because why would we bother? Because there's this external force. So I think there is some truth to it. I think it's sometimes used as a sort of get out of jail free card when programs or, or policies are not implemented seriously or not um, don't learn uh, appropriately. One of the really interesting aspects of the article was that you you pointed out all of these different waves of reform of F, of SOEs, you know, kind of from the eighties onwards, and and it's clear that the Chinese are continually reforming. Um, but one of one of the tools that they use is is this, to me quite surprising actually um, focus on on trying to mitigate some of the low level the 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 the, the impacts of these reforms on workers. Um, you know, so so there's a lot of a lot of kind of work work around that kind of you know, trying to trying to avoid workers being kicked out of their houses when the when the company they work for is restructured and so on. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that because I think it's it's an aspect of the of the Chinese system that I think doesn't actually get a lot of of, of attention overseas. Sure. And I do want to sort of qualify that to say, you know, there's actually been some great literature and work on on the fact that the major wave of SOE reform in the late 90s did lead to, um, it wasn't universal that everybody was taken care of, and it wasn't um, always thorough, complete. But I think the point that I was making is that in, in the sort of in a realistic comparison to SOE reforms elsewhere, the Chinese did do quite a bit more. And one of the core things was, you know, when I was interviewing people about the mid to late 90s in China, which was the biggest SOE reform wave between th tens of thousands of SOEs were shut down. One of the things people kept saying is like, yes, people got quite angry. There were a lot of jobs lost. But then um, one is the state more or less gave people their houses. So a lot of people have been living in housing provided by SOEs, and then that was given to people. And then that was also complemented with um, pretty um, extensive efforts to create income er er earning opportunities. So, um, you know, anybody who lived in China in the like mid 2000s to late 2000s would know, I mean, especially in Shanghai, you know, every, every street corner, you had a guy with a, um, with a flag who would whistle at you if you tried to jaywalk. Um, very, most of them were former SOE workers where they were sort of given enough of an income to stay in their homes and they had their homes and they were able to, to, to continue. Um, now, of course, that's an inefficient solution. In the long term, you want to do reskilling and retraining. There were also programs for that. But the level of, of resources and um, focus that went on dealing with those consequences was somewhat higher than I think you see in a lot of other SOE reforms where it's sort of like, oh, we'll do this, we'll downsize. And then, you know, there's a vocational college next door, which everybody knows doesn't really work. Um, but we'll kind of feed people in there for a year and hope that they get a job out on the other side. Um, and of course, part of this was just the risk of social um, uh, incohesion. There was lots of protests. There was lots of direct action. There was a case where um, after the um, oil giant Sinopec had listed, 
um, a year and a half later, a lot of the workers who were laid off in that process um, started launching pretty extensive protests um, at the Sinopec um, headquarters. And eventually the, the um, uh, Sinopec had to rewrite the severance contract and increase their severance payouts quite significantly. And they did this as a listed company and it was actually quite noted in, in the West as sort of, well, um, this is damaging shareholder interest. They're trying to be credible as a listed company. This is counterproductive. Um, but it's the kind of thing that would happen um, where if there was one social pressure was applied, um, there would be this response, um, both widespread in terms of the housing and and creating income opportunities, even if inefficient and short term, but to give people something to do while the SOE became more efficient. And then when more pro, more, more um, pressure was 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 put on them, then being able to sometimes reopen some of the, the severance contracts and other things. Support for this podcast comes from the Africa-China Reporting Project at the Wits University Journalism Department in Johannesburg. The ACRP provides reporting grants, workshops, and other professional development opportunities for journalists. Follow the ACRP on Twitter at Wits China Africa or visit africachinareporting.co.za. You mentioned in the paper, and we've discussed this previously on the program as well, that uh, Chinese SOEs operating in Africa are, are, are competitive with one another. And this is certainly the case on display in a place like the Democratic Republic of Congo, where a lot of the state-run mining companies really are in this brutal, fierce competition with one another. And I think that catches a lot of people by surprise who still have this perception that the embassies and that the government somehow are kind of controlling the, the what the what these enterprises are doing and that there is a lot more cohesion in their execution than there actually is. And I'm curious to hear what you think about the level of coordination that does in fact exist. And the reason why we're confused is just just this week, in fact, uh, the Chinese ambassador to the Democratic Republic of Congo, his name is Zhu Jing, he published a statement on the embassy website or the embassy, but he then retweeted it. So we'll give him credit for it. Uh, coming for the embassy coming to the defense of Chinese companies who are being criticized for their labor, their environmental and their abuses in in the DRC. So there we have it that a Chinese embassy is defending Chinese companies, many of which are state owned enterprises. And again, that gives the impression that there is some coordination that does happen. Now, maybe if these were all American companies, the U.S. embassy would be rallying to the defense of American companies. So maybe that's just as as far as it goes. Do you have any insights as to what level, if any, coordination there is in the foreign policy space in a place like Africa between the SOEs, the embassies, the policy banks and whatnot? I think on that, the important thing to do is to distinguish between sort of business as usual and then times when events or directives or other things happen and um, a kind of different mode of business comes into, comes into play. So when it's business as usual, there's actually quite little com um, uh, coordination. Um, principally because a lot of the SOE managers, they're responding to incentives. You know, within China, if you're managerial or above, and particularly once you get to senior manager, your career is controlled by something called the organization department, which is a wing of the uh, Chinese Communist Party. It's probably the most important organization most people have not heard of because it sets the incentives, which then set the terms of behavior of a lot of um, senior, kind of upper middle to senior um, level officials throughout the Chinese system. And they're more or less watching how is your SOE performing relative to other SOEs. So that's what creates the competition is I need to show when, you know, the organization department comes to re does my review. Um, I need to show that I'm performing better than the other SOE down the road. And so in normal, in normal times, I'm going to, um, compete with them. But and there's also the fact that within that evaluation, if a directive has come that um, has a lot of weight behind it, um, you know, not just generally sort of the attache at the embassy calls you up. If, if something significant is happening and there is a instruction or there is a, a, a requirement to do things and you have disobeyed that explicitly, um, that can be very negative on, on the evaluation. Then you're in trouble. You, you brought up the Communist Party, and I'm glad you did that. What is the delineation between the party, the state, and the company. What's the hierarchy there look like? Um, so that gets, so the first thing I should say is sometimes just the sort of 
formal organizational or ownership structure of some of these SOEs gets pretty complicated. I mean, I, I once drew a chart of just the Shanghai subway line one ownership, and it was like eight points on a PowerPoint because there were so many different boxes of how the ownership flowed. Um, but the, so, so a lot of this can become very complicated quickly. But I think the simplest way to say it is um, the state typically owns the um, company and most of the ongoing normal operations of the company will run through state processes. But uh, most of the leading managers, so senior managers in SOEs and certainly the senior state officials are Communist Party members. So they are party members and the party will control their promotion and their long-term career prospects. Um, so it's kind of the party will set the basic framework of incentives um, within which they will operate. And then most of the general operations will happen within the state. So formally, the the, the enterprises are not owned by the party. Um, the link goes that they formally they are owned by the state, um, but the personnel in the state and in the upper reaches of the company are party members and their careers are, are, are governed by the party. In, in the report, um, you, you write, um, the state is trying to get more out of SOEs and trying to use them to get more out of the private sector. I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about that dynamic. How do, how do they use the SOEs to get more out of the private sector? So the place where that's probably most clear right now is in the drive for technological self-sufficiency. Um, so this is obviously coming on the back of the US-China trade war um, and the desire to develop the high-tech industries and high-tech manufacturing. Um, and so what they'll do, what, what started to happen, and I do want to emphasize, you know, you asked, Eric asked earlier about what shouldn't we learn or what can't we learn? Sort of, this is very much um, uh, sort of vanguard of production, complicated governance capabilities, very large resources. <clears throat> Sorry. So I think this would be quite a difficult strategy to try and replicate. But what it means is um, having a, a, a symbiosis or, or, or a mix between a public entity, an SOE, that is providing, let's say, either a lot of demand, guaranteed demand, or a lot of upstream um, inputs for a the private sector to do something complicated. So the state wants to get the private sector to invest a lot more in semiconductor production. Okay, so there'll be some large SOEs that will sign large contracts to um, buy a lot of those semiconductors um, further down the line, and there will be another SOE that might invest heavily um, in some of the machinery production required to do um, initial se semiconductor uh, uh, assembly machines and, and so on. Um, so that's one dimension is those market links. And then on the governance side, they've started to um, kind of politely request, which basically means require some of the leading tech companies to take ownership stakes or equity stakes in some of the SOEs with the idea that they can get from the private sector some of their insights on, on governance and management to try and improve the SOEs. So they've also started to do that later. So it's the two angles. The one is using the SOEs um, and their capacity to invest at large scale, to commit to demand, to provide inputs, um, to uh, direct or guide where the, where the private sector is in investing and in what it's trying to do. Um, and then also trying to get private sector expertise injected more directly into the SOEs. You know, China is not the only country that does large SOEs. In, in France, for example, the state controls somewhere around 50 to 55 percent of the economy. The last statistic that I read was 56 percent. I don't know if that's still in uh, intact, but nonetheless, it's a very large portion of the economy. The French have lots of state-owned enterprises, Orano, which is formerly Arriva. They have Electricité de France. They have uh, all of the Renault, uh, all of these uh, these companies in, in various industries, mining, automotive, transportation, broadcasting. I used to work for France 24, the TV network, all state-owned. And, and I guess I'm curious to see if you've ever done any comparison or if you're familiar with with how what China does in its state-owned enterprises, let's kind of remove the Communist Party part of it, just because that is more unique to China in that respect. But in terms of the overall management and how these companies behave, is there a difference in a place like Africa or Africans can take examples from or other people can learn from how the French do it 
compared to, say, how the Chinese do it or how other Europeans do it, for example? Sure. So I think, I mean, the other interesting example there is is Germany, particularly because there's a certain federal element to that, right? So sort of Volkswagen famously is 25% owned by, um, I think it's the state of Lower Saxony, um, and there's there's several others. Um, and Germany also has this idea of, of broadcasters that are um, each of the major uh, uh, Bundesland, the provinces, have them. So there are these examples to, to mix and match from. Um, I think... Yes, I think for Europe and, and uh, for Europe, the, it's more of a historic question. So a lot of the principles underlying how they govern their SOEs were laid down more in the sort of post-war period. Um, some of the more recent reforms have not been as successful. I mean, one of the in the report, one of the things I point out is that Deutsche Telekom kind of listed at the same time as China Telekom on the exchanges. They're both state-owned, um, and Deutsche Telekom is actually much less state-owned right now. But its returns to shareholders have actually been significantly below um, China's, and that's even accounting for you know the development of the China telecom market and, and and others. So I think in Europe, I would say yes. I think it requires maybe looking a little bit further back because Europe right now is just so different, um, and also has maybe lost touch with some of those traditions. Um, but I think yes, one France and Germany, both in terms of how they structured the SOEs at the beginning and in that post-war period, how they um, used them to advance their development um, and how that can contrast with China. I think the, the other big difference between the Communist Party is also that, of course, the in China, the banks remain largely state-owned. Um, and so that control of, of, of credit um, has been different elsewhere. Although, again, Germany has a network of, in each province, you have the Landesbank, which are these 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 local provincial banks, which are quasi state owned, and which are a key element in how um, Germany channels credit to a lot of the smaller manufacturing or mid sized manufacturing companies, um, the famous uh, mid sized companies that sort of dominate certain world markets, comes through these. So there's a lot more plurality of these of these models. I think what happened is sort of. In the 90s, 2000s, under the dominance of, you know, what's now caricatured as the Washington Consensus, things got simplified quite a lot in terms of how these models worked. Um, but I think there's quite a lot to learn from these other examples, too. How, how do you see the future of SOEs in Africa? Um, do, do you, you know, um, I think, you know, so some of them, some of them are kind of hanging around in this kind of almost living fossil kind of way. Um, do you foresee that some of them might be revivified? Might there be ways to take lessons from China and elsewhere to, to, to use them more centrally in African development? Uh, you know, kind of all like, yeah, what, what kind of options do you think are open to African governments? So I think they will have to reform. They will have to change. I think too many SOEs in China, uh, sorry, in, in Africa are, um, uh, are, as you say, in that condition of, of, of not really contributing meaningfully to development any, any, anymore. But I do also think they, a lot of them have assets and they have sort of buried capabilities or um, potential that could be realized. I see more potential in the idea, in, in learning from China's model of creating sort of multiple units that are each able, that are state owned. So they have the kind of longer term time horizons. They have the ability to mobilize maybe larger amounts of capital, but are not monopolies and are not dominant or central, but are more sort of focused on certain particular activities um, and are able to pursue them somewhat aggressively. I think that's a more promising model than trying to replicate that we'll have, you know, these global giants because the scale just isn't there yet. I mean, maybe in 20 or 30 years. So to me, you know, if you ask me, take the electric state electricity company and don't see it as a vehicle to kind of become some, some behemoth, rather break it up and have five provincial renewable energy um, uh, firms that are state owned so they can mobilize state capital and they have long time horizons, but that are pursuing that. Um, or, for example, the telecoms company or the or the broadcaster break them up, and then maybe even some of them privatize or, or others retain around. I think that's the stronger middle ground between sort of never reforming them and saying, "Oh well, China works with SOEs, therefore we're fine with SOEs, and we don't actually have to do anything." 
or doing the kind of blanket privatizations where you just find that sort of assets and capabilities that have been built up and actually were inside these organizations now more or less just gets, get wasted or even worse, become the source for sort of rent seeking and just create sort of new oligopolies um, in private hands. So I think it's that in the middle, sort of we have to move forward. We have to start reforming these SOEs. Um, we can't say, oh, China um, does it. So therefore we can just sit around with these, these, these giant fossils. Um, but also the answer to it isn't just to say we try and do some big bang where it doesn't happen it's break them up make them smaller understand what they can be good at um, liberate them to a certain extent but then with very careful governance structures to watch what they're doing um, and then try and direct them as elements of a general development strategy and it seems like a lot of that is happening in ethiopia where they are privatizing a part of the telecom networks, Ethiopian Telecom. So two licenses have been up. It's been a, a difficult process, but they seem to be trying to do it. Ethiopian Airlines has survived the COVID pandemic surprisingly well, more better than pretty much any other airline on the continent. And that's, again, a state-owned enterprise. So there are some interesting models. The article is Lessons for Africa in Chinese SOE Governance by Luke Jordan. Luke is a practitioner in residence at the MIT Governance Lab. Luke, thank you so much for taking the time to join us. Absolutely fascinating article, which I recommend everybody to check out. Also, if people want to follow you on Twitter, what's the best way for them to get a hold of you? So I'm on Twitter. Um, I mostly, I do very little except occasionally tweeting a maths or probability fact. But anyway, I'm on at Luke S. Jordan. So it's Luke S. Jordan. And I'm also on LinkedIn. Okay, we'll put links to LinkedIn, Twitter, and the article in the show notes. Once again, Luke Jordan, thank you so much for taking the time. We really appreciate it. It's a pleasure. Thank you very much for having me. That was not the conversation that I thought we were going to have. And, and I have to be honest with you, I'm a little jaded, I think, and my kind of perception of the discussion about Chinese state-owned enterprises has been warped a little bit, I think, by the American discourse out of Washington, which I consume a lot of, to be honest with you. But the conversation about SOEs is how distortive they are, how they're not as productive how they are really a drain on the economy. We hear about the the amount of, of, of bankruptcies and, the, and, and just how much credit they're sucking in to the detriment of other parts of the economy. And so to see this more balanced perspective and especially how aspects of it, and he was very particular in the paper, to right up front, he says, listen, this is not a wholesale copy of. So the China model, let's, again, I'm using air quotes that nobody can see, is not applicable to Africa, but there are strains of what these companies are doing and how they are being managed by their state backers, whether they be at the provincial, municipal, or at the central government level. Yeah, I mean, you know, we have to take into account the, you know, the fact that that kind of Western thinking about about these issues um, come from a particular place, you know, a particular background. But and be careful on the Western thing. I, I'm just sorry, sorry well, to interrupt you ahead. because state-owned enterprises in France and Germany are super popular. So I'm not sure this is a Western thing. This might be a U.S. thing. Yes, yeah, so maybe maybe the Western is the wrong word. Like maybe kind of like Anglosphere kind of way of thinking or U.S. way of thinking. You know, kind of where where there's just a lot of a lot of kind of hostility towards the state-owned sector as a whole. You know, kind of and just just a kind of a strong thinking that that the private sector is just inherently better at X, Y, Z, like, you know, fill in the gap. Um, that, I think, is, a, is a, there's a significant gap between discourses in the U.S. and in places like Africa around these issues. And I think African countries are a lot more interested interested in the in how the Chinese manage to make these state-owned enterprises work because they are... You know, whether in Africa they they are just kind of like part of the landscape. They're kind of like structurally so cent central to many of the economies that there is one has to do something with them. So in that sense, I think the 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 discourse about what China did and what they didn't, and then you know, kind of what was successful and what might be replicable. I think there's a lot more kind of interest in that issue in Africa than in many other places. Well, here in Asia. Let's be very clear, this is not a Chinese thing. The, the state-owned enterprise plays an incredibly important role in Singapore, in Japan, in Korea, or it's the role of the state with national champions. So Samsung may be a private company, but it enjoys the protection of 
from competition, from foreign competition, that a state-owned enterprise would get. So it's it's enabled to be private, but really, again, at the at the benefit of the state in many respects. So that that line between state and public and private here in Asia is also very very blurry. I'm in Vietnam. Vietnam is like China, where there's a lot of state-owned enterprises. Uh, there's not a huge amount of objection to it in that respect. People, in fact. They, they, a lot of parents want their kids to go work for state-owned enterprises because they think it's a more stable job, whatnot. Obviously, these are authoritarian states where any type of that objection is not necessarily visibly heard. But for the most part, they do believe that there is a role for the state in critical industries like telecommunications and aviation. And that's a very common throughout Asia. So I don't think in that sense that Africa is that exceptional. Yeah, I think in, in, in the case of Africa, what, what's added to that is that the state just has a much, uh, traditionally much larger role in providing social goods. Um, you know, so so the the state is kind of directly on the hook to provide, for, in, in many cases, to provide housing, for example. Um, you know, and, and so so that kind of relationship between the citizen and, and the state, um, the state-owned enterprises play a really larger role in, in kind of mediating that link between the, the citizen and the state in Africa. Well, let's leave the conversation there. Absolutely fascinating. It goes to the heart of the, the, the you know the kind of engagement that China is doing, and we're going to see more corporate engagement. So, understanding how the SOEs operate in Africa and what lessons can be learned from them is going to be very important going forward. Uh, very quickly before we go, we're putting together some more cool new things. As you've seen, we've redone our homepage on our website. We've got a lot more news from across the global south. We're also going to be launching a new Patreon page for our uh, podcast, and we're going to be launching a new podcast this fall called China and the Global South or something to that effect where we're going to look at what China's doing in other parts of the Global South beyond Africa. So that'll be a different feed. Keep your eye out for that. So we got a bunch of new things going on right now. If you'd like to be at the heart of everything that we're doing and you love these kind of conversations that we've had today, you're going to want to sign up for a subscription to the China Africa Project website, just $75 a year for students and teachers and $149 for everybody else. Go to ChinaAfricaProject.com slash subscribe. We're so excited to see the growth in the reader community and the daily newsletter and all the feedback that we're getting. So we love having these discussions with you. If you'd like to reach out to Kobus or I, super easy, super accessible, eric at chinaafricaproject.com or Kobus at chinaafricaproject.com. Cliff, our Africa editor, is available at cliff at chinaafricaproject.com. So we've got a great team here putting together all this amazing information. We'd love for you to join that community. So that'll do it for this edition of the show. Kobus and I will be back again next week with another episode. Until then, for Kobus van Staden and Johannes I'm Eric Olander. Thank you so much for listening. The discussion continues online. Head over to facebook.com slash China Africa Project to share your thoughts on today's show. Or follow the guys on Twitter. Eric's at Iolanda, and you can find Kobas at Stadenesk. For more information about the China Africa Project and to sign up for our free weekly email news brief, go to ChinaAfricaProject.com. Project.com.